The truth is that artistic provocateurs expect us to keep our discomfort private, an unwritten rule that for years has caused some gallery goers to suppress their feelings about the creepiness of some of Henson's images. Yet when that disquiet is expressed in public, it's derided as moral atavism or bourgeois sensibility. It's the same put-down used by the porn industry's academic apologists who argue that efforts to restrict porn are always, in the words of one, the puritanical repression of healthy sexuality. For them, healthy sexuality now encompasses multiple penetration, hair pulling and facial ejaculation. Those who object to modern porn's brutalisation of sexual intimacy including many authentic feminists, do no more than attempt to rescue the true meaning of liberation. I've said that Henson's images aren't pornographic, but they're only one artistic decision away from it. Call to mind the pictures that you would have seen reproduced, showing the girl's full body. And and imagine that picture with one or two minor changes if she'd been looking into the camera, for instance, or had her head tilted at a coquettish angle, or if the camera had been positioned a little differently so as to expose more of her vulva, then the images would have taken on a very different meaning. Instead of pushing the boundary, they would have crossed it. Now, I make this point to confront the claims to artistic freedom advanced by several prominent Henson defenders, including Julian tonight. No one in this hall believes that that right is unlimited. Yet every time someone raises a moral objection to an artistic work, they meet condescension and derision, as if moral sensibility is always rooted in aesthetic ignorance. If a couple of barely perceptible changes to the works in question would have rendered them pornographic, why are defenders of artistic licence so incensed when questions are asked. While much of the talkback chatter over the Henson affair was ugly and ill-informed, the moral panic from the great unwashed has been matched and exceeded by the censorship panic from the aesthetes. So incontinent has been their language, I'm sure that if there were a real attempt to suppress artistic freedom in this country, they'd be struck dumb. For instance, under the heading, the country's cultural agenda is being hijacked by witch hunters, vigilantes and reactionary politicians, art critic John MacDonald characterises the Henson outcry as an international humiliation, an enormous embarrassment, the ramifications of which hardly bear thinking about. MacDonald then evoked the image of Orwell's thought police, and compares those who question Henson to the Taliban. He finishes off by accusing Hetty Johnson of hysteria. There is no censorship worth noting in Australia. Is anyone seriously arguing that we live in an era of sexual repression? As if our culture were not awash with erotic imagery and sex talk? As if our society did not allow a vast smorgasbord of sexual practices catering to almost every taste. Does anyone believe we should be more preoccupied with sex than we are now? And yet when any limit is suggested, such as measures to shield children from this confusing and at times disturbing world of sexual pleasure, an outcry goes up from the civil libertarians whose fears were formed in the 60s. After the sexual revolution, gay liberation and the women's movement, virtually every taboo has been swept away. For most Australians, there remain only three, incest, bestiality and pedophilia. The first two are now being eroded and I suspect the internet has spawned a huge increase in desire for the third. For those who want to push the sexual limits, these are the only ones left. I, for one, with all of my history of progressive advocacy, 
and willing to stand up and say, thus far and no more. Perversion is not subversion. The truth is that the avant-garde, who imagine themselves defying the rules of a repressive society, are trapped in the past, wrestling with the phantoms of Lady Chatterley's lover and Portnoy's complaint. The sexual revolution, with all of its celebration of diversity and invitation to transgress, is over, and we won. In fact, the boundaries have been pushed back so far that the world of adults and then the world of teenagers became overloaded with sexual freedoms and erotic imagery to the point where the marketing culture has had to seek fresh pastures, finding them in children's untapped sexual possibilities. This is the new world we live in. The libertarian outpourings in support of Henson and artistic freedom are curiously obsolete. The power has shifted. Hegemony no longer lies with a reactionary conservative culture. It lies with the corporations and the culture makers in the media. Pushing the boundaries is now a marketing technique. The advertising industry must keep alive the image of the conservative moraliser in order to convince their target market that they still have something to rebel against. Transgression is passé. Subverting the dominant paradigm is old hat. The enemies of culture are not to be found in the brick veneers of the suburbs, but in the creative department of Saatchi and Saatchi. Today, the historic mission is no longer to turn, tear down, but to rebuild. The task is for us to understand that freedom cannot be found in a moral free-for-all, but only in the careful exercise of restraint. Thank you.